Greg Hallaton. We're covering part two. We did part one yesterday, and we're looking at the Constitution, the Queen, and we're talking about the House of Lords. Now, I think many of you will know that I've done about five or six videos now on the House of Lords, especially around the time of 1999, when we lost so many of our hereditary peers or lords, and they were had their letters patent removed, and out they were kicked out the door, never to return. So, Greg, we've, we've discussed this at length off air. Uh, good evening and welcome. Good evening. Where shall we go with the House of Lords? Well, a lot of people are quoting the, the Lords going missing in the 2000s, but 266 Lords went missing in 1996 to 98. So when I mentioned this to you off air, it was from memory, and then I looked on my computer, and so I pumped in 200, uh, 266 laws, and this affidavit came up, and it's over, it's about 340 pages, and I'd completely forgotten I'd done it, and I'd researched all of this topic, and just left it sitting on my computer, 98% finished, and the reason I didn't finish it was because the notaries stopped witnessing my work because they swear two oaths to the Queen and they make their living signing documents and my documents were a challenge to the Queen. So they said, oh, we can't sign this. So I ended up with these documents 98% done and really I've just got to divide them into statement of claim and evidence. Um, so I've done a lot of research on this and no one's brought up any of the points that I've made. So what I thought I'd do is read it out, read okay. out about four pages, maybe six, but <clears throat> really three or four pages is enough for an interview. And you'll get to see from what I've researched and written, you'll get to see just how backhanded the whole House of Lords and Privy Council is and how the UK's had incredibly corrupt politicians from John Major to Tony Blair to Gordon Brown to David Cameron to Theresa May. They've all just been noise and giving off the vibe of Parliament and giving off the vibe of government and giving off the vibe that Elizabeth is the Queen but she's not, and it appears that the government and the parliament, which are two different things, are ambiguous as well. And even I thought the government was banksters, actually. But would you like to explain the makeup of the Privy Council? Well, and why was it set up? When was it set up, the Privy well, Council? Well, I, I don't really want to get into sort of guesswork. I've got it written here. But what okay. I've is that their, the oath that they swear to the Queen is to let anything against the Queen, which we think means to allow. And on Wikipedia, it's let is spelt L-E-T, but on the actual written document, it's spelt L-E-T-T, -T, which means to condemn. Right? So the Privy Council has to condemn anything against the Queen, L-E-T-T. -T. So what they're doing is they're telling one story to the unresearching public and they're telling another story to those who do the research. Yeah. And what, what I've found is that you can actually legally depose the Queen from office if she is not fulfilling her office and if she is not who she claims she is and also if she is acting in treason. So the research, I did the bulk of it in August 2016, and you can actually depose the Queen. And by her signing the Maastricht Treaty and the Lisbon Treaty, you can yeah. actually depose her. It, it, it is allowed to depose Elizabeth. And she has also been advocating to me in an abundance of ways, which I've illustrated to you very 
briefly without actually showing you any of the physical objects. So what I thought we'd do today is show the causation of what we've been doing since 1996 on the Lords abandoning the House of Lords and abandoning all the privileges because they have refused to swear an oath to the Queen when it became patently obvious to them that she is not the Queen, that she is not George VI's daughter, that she is not the primary descendant of the royal family, and that she does not have the true sword, and she also does not have the caduceus, which is hangs here, hangs about here, right? And or looking at here. It's, it's, silver nickel. it's a silver nickel object, um, hangs just below the neck right. of the chest, um, and it's about the size of a short pen, and she doesn't have the caduceus to take the monarch, and we do. In 1999, at the Royal Victoria and Albert Museum, they were having a display, and they displayed a fake caduceus of Queen Victoria. And my co-author, Francisco Manuel, sent a fax to the Royal Albert Museum and the, and the Queen and said, you're displaying a fake caduceus. Here's an image of the real caduceus to trade as the monarch of the British royal family. And they immediately closed down that stall of the exhibition, but they also closed down half of the floor going east-west and half the floor going north-south. So they, they, they closed off about a third of one whole level of the exhibition so they didn't just pluck out the caduceus and, and, and sort of remove the label caduceus. They closed down a third of the floor because they were so embarrassed because we have the caduceus to trade as the monarch and we also have the sword to knight people. So all of the knighthoods that have come from Queen Elizabeth are utterly fake. They're not real. Do we know how many she created? I don't have the numbers on that. So what I thought I'd do is read what I found out. It's the best way because I've sworn this. I know it's true. So here we go. Title, The Crown, Throne and Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars Use Queen, Queen to Ban Lords. Francisca Manuel opened the True Royal Dossier in February 1996. This was the chest full of royal marks from Queen Victoria confirming her firstborn legitimate son, Prince Marcus Manuel, with other documents and royal marks from other European royal families, which were given to us. Word leaked out that Elizabeth was not the Queen, is not a monarch with the right to rule, is not Her Majesty, is not the Sovereign, and is not Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Then in 1997, Prime Minister John Major publicly said, quote, the Queen is now just a commoner, end quote. What year did John Major say that? 1997, and he was Prime Minister from 1990 to 97. The Queen is now a commoner. The Queen is now just a commoner. So what happened to her then? Well, I'm going to explain and I'm going to show. Here we go. The proclamation, which was Queen Elizabeth II's proclamation that she was the Queen, the proclamation as published by Her Majesty's Stationery Office, which is small caps, and the London Gazette, which is bold, May, June 1953, confirmed that Elizabeth Alexandra Mary has always been a commoner by recording the Queen in all caps, Elizabeth in all caps italics, R dot, Her Majesty's Governments in normal uppercase and lowercase lettering, Elizabeth II Queen and all caps, God Save the Queen. So when you've got the all caps, it's read in a different language. It's read in ancient Latin. And italics is the language of legally ambiguous. So anything in italics is considered to be legally ambiguous. And Elizabeth is all caps italics, which means it's ancient Latin or dog Latin and is legally ambiguous. The Queen Elizabeth, God Save the Queen, all caps, 
uh, legally ambiguous ancient Latin gobbledygook to be removed off the page into another jurisdiction being purgatory. Jurisdiction, right. Now we're talking. Are we, are we talking about realms, though? No, we're actually talking about the proclamation that Elizabeth made and when she made her proclamation in 1953, it was illegally recorded and backdated fraudulently. And it had three colons and uh, three quotations and paragraph indents, which mean Elizabeth II, Queen, Queen is a suffix, it's not Queen Elizabeth II, it's Elizabeth II, Queen, which means suffix, which means bankrupt or illegitimate it means delinquent right so really yeah yeah yeah, she's a delinquent elizabeth the second queen on her proclamation is a moot point hearsay with a suffix queen meaning delinquent capital r without a dot means went on a royal visit or a royal tour it doesn't mean royal now capital r with a dot is a connivance, fraud, and forgery attempting to be royal. Elizabeth can use R, but cannot use R dot. Her Majesty's Governments, quote, Her Majesty's Governments is not Elizabeth II, which means Elizabeth II born. She was the second born in stature because she wasn't George VI's daughter, but... George Fitzratima in New Zealand was George VI's son that I was introduced to in 1967, and that's what we spoke about last night. The 1953 proclamation by Elizabeth revealed Elizabeth as a flat lie royal, italicised, legally ambiguous, all caps, ancient Latin, gobbledygook, non-royal, colour of law style, suffixed, delinquent queen. And in 1996... Queen Victoria's firstborn legitimate son, Prince Marcus Manuel, was revealed as acknowledged with royal marks and other documents from European royalty. It's what happened to acknowledge Prince Marcus Manuel as the true royal. All the royal families in Europe hand-delivered royal marks, often by the princess, who was closest in age to Prince Marcus Manuel, in hopes of marriage. Right? So with the patriotic blindfolds removed, the lords, back onto the lords now, the lords could now see through Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Mountbatten. Mountbatten is the surname given to illegitimate royals. Mountbatten. That was decided in 1947. Prince Harry is Prince Harry Mountbatten because he's illegitimate. So with the patriotic... Well, many people don't know that, though, do they, that Harry is illegitimate? Oh, they, they, almost everyone in Britain knows that, really. It's, it's well accepted. Um, so Harry was born on my 23rd birthday um, on purpose. With the patriotic blindfolds removed, the Lords could now see through Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Mountbatten that she was a flat ride royal with no real titles or styles and was a colour-of-law-styled dog-and-pony show masquerading as Queen Elizabeth i.e. she's a batard. Commoners have bastards and in royalty they're called batards is when they're not the child of both parents. And in Elizabeth's case, she's not the child of King George VI and her mother is not Elizabeth Bell's Lion. It is Elizabeth Bell's Lion's maid. So Elizabeth is actually a double batard and she's actually one of the most illegitimate people on the planet. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's just so, so illegitimate. There's actually 23 illegitimacies on the main trunk line. 266 royal dukes, dukes, marquises, earls, viscounts, countesses, and lords then refused to swear the new oath to Anne Elizabeth. In the true status as a commoner, she's Anne Elizabeth. 266 royal dukes, dukes, marquises, earls, viscounts, countesses and lords then refused to swear the new oath to Anne Elizabeth, to Queen Elizabeth II, nor to Her Majesty, recognising her to her own word as that Elizabeth is an 
all caps, ancient Latin, legally ambiguous, color of law entity who was on a royal tour when her father died, purposefully. First she went to Canada and then she went to somewhere like Zimbabwe. And she did the longest royal tour in history. I think it was seven weeks in Canada. So that when her father died, so that she could use the letter R. Right? And then someone else would come along and add a dot and people would go, Oh, that means royal. No, it doesn't. It means being on a royal tour. So, ancient Latin, legally ambiguous, colour of law entity who was on a royal tour when her father died but was not his daughter and that she could only be saved by unsubstantiated parochial fictions that conceal and confuse the real facts. I.e., all caps, God save the Queen. Right? Right. So God save the Queen means only God can save the Queen. I've heard that before, actually. Well, yeah. yes. Okay. Now, I'm actually her guardian. She's actually my charge. So I'm actually in charge of protecting her when she abdicates. She was given to me in uh, October 2011. I think it was a... Oh, 7th or 10th of October 2011, she was given to me. So, <clears throat> anyway. Who gave, it, who gave it to you? The Sangreal. The what? The Sangreal. And who's that? You know, the, the book The Holy Grail. Yeah. And the movie, The Da Vinci Code, I think it was called. Yeah. Well, they, they were in search of the Sangreal. Yeah, and the Sangreal was my co-author. Francisco Manuel opened the dossier in February 1996. Now, before April 1997, members of parliament who did not take the oath, did not receive a salary, take their seat, speak in debates, nor vote. They were barred from proceedings, but were still entitled to the other facilities of the House, which is of Westminster, of parliament. After the 1st of May 1997 general election regarding members of Parliament who had not taken the oath by July 1997, the Speaker also removed the right of any such members of Parliament to the services of the House so they couldn't go in, have a drink, stay the night, get a ride in a limousine, have a, have a free lunch, use the secretarial services, etc. Uh, the ongoing colour of law style, all seasons in one day, fashion show, also styled Elizabeth, quote, the Queen's Majesty, end quote, Her Majesty's person, Her Majesty's honour, Her Majesty's crown, Her Majesty's dignity royal, Her Majesty herself, none of which are Her Majesty or Her Majesty Elizabeth, nor Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. So any of the titles that would pertain to, oh, this is definitely the Queen, look at the way she's presented as Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth or Her Majesty Elizabeth or Her Majesty, none of those phrases are used. Right? Right. It's Her Majesty's honour, Her Majesty's crown, Her Majesty's person, the Queen's majesty. And none of those are saying that Elizabeth is the Queen, Right. It's colour of law. And I'm talking about what the Privy Council says. So this is in the Privy Council Oath and other places. So no one's actually saying that Elizabeth is a queen. And she's not queen of the land. She's not queen of the people. She's queen of dolphins and swans. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, um, <laughs> I mean, it does your head in, doesn't it? When I, when I was finding this stuff out, I was like, Oof. But I'll, I'll read on, and it'll, it'll all tie in, right? So, um, in 1997, Her Majesty, quote, Her Majesty, end quote, was used three times with Privy Council as a suffix modifying the title and used one time with Privy Council as a prefix servant modifying the title. Elizabeth always relied on tacit consent, ambiguous connivance to keep hidden that all caps Her Majesty, all caps italics Her Majesty, and italics Her Majesty, 
meant that she had annexed the crown to silent weapons for quiet wars under threat of exposure and that the Privy Council work in support of this connivance. So why did the Privy Council support this connivance? What were they getting out of this? The coronation on the 2nd of June 1953 is never called Elizabeth's coronation. It's always called Coronation Day. And it wasn't the coronation of Elizabeth Mountbatten or Elizabeth Windsor or even Elizabeth Saxe-Coburg and Gotha. It was the coronation of silent weapons for quiet wars. It was handing over the crown to silent weapons for quiet wars. The silent weapons for quiet wars was crowned, took over the crown on Coronation Day, 1953, 2nd of June. And they have a war going against the civilian population to keep them down. Since that day? Yeah. And the book called Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars came out around that time. And they just took over all governments. The common purpose is part of Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars. So common purpose has been going since 1953? Yeah. Right. Yeah, it did actually get published in 1953. So Coronation was the crowning, handing over the crown to Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars because Elizabeth was not the daughter of King George VI. And the person person who's behind this connivance is Prince Philip. He works for Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars, which is very closely associated with DVD, Deutsche Vertikonsdienst, which is a German group, and it means for whom the war never ended. Right? So the Coronation Day 1953 was essentially... Germans and Nazis taking over Britain and the world and all the colonies and holding down the whole population, holding down the whole civilization and taxing them. And silent weapons for quiet wars, we now know as the European Union. Right. But then, of course, it's bigger than the European Union, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's also MIT. Uh, There's also CIA and it's also deep state. But the deep state in America is the crown in the UK. The English version of deep state is the crown. Right, okay, I'm learning a lot tonight, I must admit. Further in early 1998, Elizabeth masquerading as the colour of law styled queen made conditions of lords swearing the new oath to her even more severe such that if one did not, they could be fined £500 for every such offence, lose their office, lose all privileges of the house, and if there was any attempt to take their seat, speak in debates or vote, they would have their seat declared vacant, quote, as if they were dead, end quote, even if physically sitting in that seat. Now, that's just absolute fascism. They want to keep it absolutely quiet from any lord who did not swear an oath and the new oath to Elizabeth when it became apparent that Elizabeth was a fraud, right, which began in February 1996. Yeah. So this is the run-up to the House of Lords Act. So some peers went by the wayside before that date. Well, well I'm, I'm actually talking about from February 1996 to about the 1st of April 1998, that's when 266 lords were silenced and kicked out of the House for refusing to swear an oath to Queen Elizabeth II because they knew that she was not the Queen. So they were acting honourably and they were treated dishonourably. So in that period, 1996 to 98, you have the dishonouring of the House and what was left were the dishonourable lords remained, right? Yeah? yeah. So I'll carry on reading. As if they were dead. Further, the House of Lords made additional restrictions that these 266 lords were no longer listed as members of the House of Lords and had no right to the services of the House, so it was as if they were dead. By rank, these were three royal dukes, 12 other dukes, 16 marquises, 
48 earls, 32 viscounts, three countesses, and 152 lords, being 173 of undeclared political alliances, 46 crossbenchers, 35 conservatives, four Labour, and two Liberal Democrats. The legally ambiguous, non-royal, colour of law style, Suffolk delinquent, flat lie royal Queen Elizabeth II had stripped the speaking rights of anyone who knew she used the R from royal visit or royal tour and not from a regnant, regina or royal, and who knew that Her Majesty herself and Her Majesty's person are just the commoner Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Mountbatten with no styles or titles, and Her Majesty's honour is without honour or titles and has only colour of law styles. She doesn't have titles, she just has styles, and even those styles are colour of law. Her Majesty's Dignity Royal is an unsubstantiated parochial fiction that conceals and confuses the real facts that Elizabeth is illegitimate and has four children to three different fathers. Her Majesty only exists as acknowledged by foreign government representatives and the stationary office. The Queen's Majesty and Her Majesty's Crown are oxymorons wherein the Crown was annexed to silent weapons for quiet wars and Elizabeth was only ever sovereign of the Commonwealth for the very limited period of six years and one month from the 2nd of June 1953 to the 1st of July 1959 when the Commonwealth changed and became Commonwealth of Nations or seven years and five months from when her house father George VI died on New Zealand Day, 6 February 1952. Right, so we've got, you just said that the Queen had four children by three different fathers. Who were the fathers as a matter of interest? So Prince Philip was not one of those fathers. Prince Philip was the father of Prince Charles and Princess Anne, and then they were but ugly, and Prince Charles was considered the royal runt. And no one was no one was allowed to breed off the royal runt. So Diana was actually instructed by Queen Elizabeth to breed off other people. Right. So Queen Elizabeth actually instructed Diana to breed not with Charles. This is fascinating. Yeah. So so Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip they had two children in very quick succession, born in nineteen forty eight and forty nine, and then there was about a twelve year gap. And then Prince Andrew was born in 1960 and Prince Edward was born in 1964. Prince Andrew's father is Elizabeth II's racing manager, Lord Porchester, who's 7th Earl of Carnarvon. And Prince Edward's father is Lord Plunkett, who ran all the staff in Buckingham Palace. And they dress themselves up as commoners and sneak into movies. So that makes three different fathers. And all of those fathers were in the triumvirate, which was the heroin trafficking triumvirate. So the heroin trafficking triumvirate consisted of Lord Louis Mountbatten, Prince Philip, Lord Porchester and Lord Plunkett. And they ran all the heroin in the world. Oh, my goodness. Right. And that heroin was aimed at all the true royals. The true royals. Yeah, the true royals. So they oh. they used heroin and aimed it at the true royals, right? So wherever the true royals were, they would aim it. So I moved twice when I was growing up, and Prince Philip's agents in New Zealand always moved to the same town that I was in, and they were within 400 metres. And I used to watch the heroin being dragged out of Tauranga Harbour and taken up to... Peter Williams QC, who was Prince Philip's agent in New Zealand, and he was staying with his legal partner um, in the same house and sharing the same office. And that legal partner was Winston Peters, right? They shared the had legal offices they shared, and the, the um, Peter Williams, um, who was actually the mafia boss, he was staying with um, Winston Peters, and Winston Peters is now the deputy prime minister of New Zealand. 
and he was a major heroin trafficker. And he was actually questioned by the police over the most famous double murders in New Zealand, um, murders of Harvey and Jeanette Crew. So it, what, what it looks like is that the heroin traffickers who were working for Prince Philip ended up becoming Deputy Prime Minister. So we have to look. David Cameron was a heroin trafficker in Africa, heroin, heroin and opioid trafficker. So we've actually got to look at the MPs and, and, and again and say, hang on a minute, were these people child prostitutes, heroin and opioid traffickers who were made members of parliament and even prime minister because they knew the secrets and it was the best way of keeping them silent? I'm quite, um, it's not often that I'm uh, so flabbergasted by what my guests say, but you have shocked me more than probably anybody else. <laughs> I knew nothing about all, you know, I, I knew that May, that there were all these rumours about May and her husband um, and cocaine farms and, and this, that and the other, but the royal family, I knew nothing about this. Well, they're not royal when you think about it because the coronation was not of Elizabeth but the coronation was of silent weapons for quiet wars, then there's no integrity coming out of the British royal family because, A, they're not royal, and, B, they're heroin trafficking and they're aiming that at the true royals in order to get them onto heroin so that they would be entirely useless. Now, I remember in the 70s that all these royal-looking people who were junkies, I don't know if you remember that, but there are a lot of aristocrats just... I wasn't born then. What? In the 70s, did you say? <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK. Gave the game away. Well, no, I never really studied the royals. I mean, we just we were just all brought up to hold them in such, you know, with high regard. Well, everybody okay. had a book. Everybody had a mug, a, a, a royal a wedding mug or glass. Well, that's, that's, that's part of the PR, you know? And you, you, I mean, Edward VII used to sell toothpaste with his image on it in order to promote himself. I mean, you know, when I was growing up, there used to be royal biscuit tins with pictures of the royal family or, you know, Elizabeth and Philip on biscuit tins. And those biscuits would put you straight to sleep. That was just great. Wow. Remember that? So, so, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, basically, then. So where where are we today? Then what we what we're gonna do? I mean, actually, I don't know whether I didn't say this on air, but it's it's very depressing. Actually, I've been sort of very optimistic that we can get ourselves out of this mess, but now the problem has presented itself in, in the way you've said, and I'm thinking. Well, where do we start? Well, the first thing to do is always to lay the truth out plain, right? And then people can go, oh, no, that guy, he's full of crap, you know? Don't believe Well, we had that, didn't we? From last night's show, we had somebody who'd been serving in the green jackets who really could not take what you'd said at all. Well, it's interesting because I get some of my information from them, right? <laughs> in answer to your question, I'll tell you what they did, yeah? what the Lords did. House of Lords attempts to change the oath away from, quote, the serving monarch, end quote. 12th of June, 2008, 22 members of Parliament brought an early day motion number 1780 to change the oath of allegiance before the House of Commons, quote, that this House recognises that the principal duty of honourable members is to represent their constituents in Parliament, also recognises that some honourable members would prefer to swear an oath of allegiance to their constituents and the nation rather than the monarch, and therefore calls on the Leader of the House to bring forward legislative proposals to introduce an optional alternative parliamentary oath allowing honourable members to swear allegiance to their constituents and the nation and to pledge to uphold the law rather than one pledging personal allegiance to the serving monarch, end quote. 
right? So this is 2008. Note the 22 MPs use the term serving monarch, not monarch, not queen, not sovereign, not her majesty. Many of these members of parliament and lords consider Elizabeth to be an imposter. The desire was to swear allegiance to their constituents, nation and the law in preference to the serving monarch, which appears to be contrary to constituents, nation, law as the serving monarch is extorted by foreign powers, including silent weapons for quiet wars, and whose reign it is. Right? We're in the reign of silent weapons for quiet wars. Now, when Elizabeth wrote, all caps, a proclamation in the second year of our reign, our, legally our, means we. So it reads, in the second year, we reign as silent weapons for quiet wars. So it's Queen Elizabeth II's A proclamation is, in the second year we reign as silent weapons for quiet wars, wherein only God can save the Queen. <laughs> so we're not saying that, we're not actually saying that there's not going to be any more wars, because we obviously have been in wars, we're just not going to say anything about them. Well, it's not that. It's, what, it's, what they're saying is that the um, if you actually read the text, the Elizabeth proclamation was that she was a moot point here saying was not the queen in any way. It says many times over that it is a moot point hearsay that Elizabeth is the queen and she is really a suffix delinquent parochial fiction with no real titles and colour of law styles. So in which case then, if she <laughs> is a nobody... And she's in charge of all of us. We we could have anybody then, could we? Yes, yes, except that at the same time that Elizabeth was being crowned, a movie came out called Roman Holiday. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. With Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn. Now, that movie was codified, and Roman Holiday is an anagram of H Royal Domain which means the transfer of her royal domain to his royal domain. And the lead character was Joe, or Joseph, played by Gregory Peck. So the lead character was Joseph Gregory, right? And my name's Joseph Gregory. My name is Joseph Gregory Hallett. My name was known from 1618 from the Rosicrucian cosmography. So they made the movie Roman Holiday, which is heavily codified and even has live actors in it, Prince Philip's in it. I actually did a movie on it and they took it down. They closed down the whole website. I had three websites with it up and they just closed it all down. They did not like that scene. And when they're sitting in the cafe in Roman Holiday, the real-life Prince Philip walks along in front of the Pantheon with a British naval admiral in real life and no one's ever picked that up I was the one who spotted that Oh, is it? Right, yeah. okay. Well, it is before my time, I'd be honest. It is before my time. Well, it's, well, it's interesting. It's eight years before my time as well, but they clearly named me in it. And there's one scene in the bedroom where Joseph Gregory, Peck, Joseph Gregory, sits down on his bed and there's a crown above his head, right? Sitting right there, just right there, a crown. And then Princess Anne, who's played by Audrey Hepburn, 
She stands next to the crown, and below the crown is a zero. So it, it reads zero crown over Princess Anne, who's playing in the movie, Elizabeth. And she says... I'm not... I'm not... I'm not... I'm not... I'm not... I'm not the Queen, right? And zero crown. And Joseph Gregory sits on the bed and there's a crown straight above his head, on his head, effectively. It's all codified. And the distances in metres between the three locations they go to, like on the barge singing and back to Joseph Gregory's apartment and to the Roman ruins, it's all by road in all three directions it is 2017 meters so that alluded to the year 2017 which is the year that i made those movies gosh right so it's all it's it's really very codified And the hairdresser cuts Princess Anne, who represents Queen Elizabeth, gives Princess Anne, Queen Elizabeth, a haircut. And the, the saying, taking a haircut, is when, let's say, you've got two houses and there's a financial crash and you only end up with one house, right? That's called taking a haircut. So Princess Anne goes in with really long, beautiful hair and they just cut her hair off as a bob. And so she was getting a haircut. Now, the person who cut her hair in the movie was the real-life homosexual lover of the Pope, right? Pope Paul VI. And he became the Pope a few years later, not many years later. And he was the one who extorted Elizabeth to steal all of her real titles and leave her only with colour of law styles because he knew she was illegitimate. So we have real live actors in the movie. Yeah? The last thing I said reading was, where and only God can save the Queen. The Privy Council swears an oath to condemn anything against the Queen. Quote, we will let, L-E-T-T, -T, we will let anything against Her Majesty. And let is spelled L-E-T-T, -T, which means to condemn to condemn all who criticise the false queen, the fake Her Majesty, the non-existent sovereign, and all below privy councillors are encouraged to follow. So all below privy councillors, all the British commoners are encouraged to follow the lie that the privy councillors dictate. All privy councillors, lords in the House of Lords, member of parliament, judges, magistrates, justice of the peace, notaries, lawyers, police and military have committed treason in this way. To swear an oath to Queen Elizabeth II of the United Kingdom, knowing that she is not and never has been a queen, the queen, her majesty, the sovereign, our lady sovereign, regnant, regina, r dot, nor royal, is treason. To continue to do so knowing this is a disregard for constitutional conventions and confirmation of treason. They know, and now that you know they know, and they know you know they know, if any of these swear an oath to serve a non-queen as queen and illegitimate as Her Majesty or a misnamed Elizabeth, all caps italics, as a sovereign, they are committing treason. The oath of the UK Privy Councillors, Lords in the House of Lords, Members of Parliament, Judges, Magistrates, Justice of the Peace, Notaries, Lawyers, Police and Military is an oath of treason. I understood that the oaths that they all swore were Rothschild oaths and they were satanic. Is that what we're sort of saying? Yes, and I have a remedy here. Anyone who swears an oath to the serving queen is committing treason. Anyone who has sworn an oath to the serving monarch has committed treason. The remedy to the colour of law styled Queen Elizabeth II and the oaths people have sworn to silent weapons for quiet wars entity is... Anyone who has sworn an oath to the serving queen can have their oath transferred to the remedy, being the Lord Chancellor of the Kingdoms of England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Hanover, and the Duchy of Saxon, Coburg, and Gotha, Arch Treasurer, Guardian of the Royal Secret, with letters patent, 
royal prerogative of customary title, tradition received confirmation being Joseph Gregory Hallett. It actually says that. That's the remedy. That's the remedy. I realise that it is a lot of information. I know. I just <laughs> like to say that I read page 98, 99 and 100, so there were 97 pages of build-up to what I just told you, and there's another 200 pages following. So the last paragraph I read about transferring the oath to me is followed by another 200 pages of substantiation. What was that document called, the about, one that you've been reading through? The court notices, Queen Elizabeth II has no titles of best colour of law styles, public notice. Court notice, public notice, Queen Elizabeth II has no titles at best colour of law styles. The Empress has new clothes, the naked Queen. Joseph Gregory Hallett holds the letters of entitlement to the throne and holds the title of the crown and the position of law to the end of time. Affidavit of Joseph Gregory Hallett. This affidavit is addressed to Queen Elizabeth II, etc. Well, I never heard Boris Johnson talking about the Queen in this way or any of the other politicians come to that. So, Greg, have a good evening. Thanks for coming on. And thanks to everybody at home. And uh, I bid you farewell and a good night to all. The future King of England. You've sure. come back.